Go, no go for lockdown, behind the biggest decision in UK history. What went on in the war room as Johnson prepared to take a giant leap for vaccine? Note to censors, we use only government data. If you have a problem with the results, speak to the government. Note to censors, we use modified images with sources attributed to highlight the gravity of the issues under discussion as per fair use. The war metaphor has been thrown around, particularly and very heavily, by Thomas Poyer et al. Fighting the vaccine, sorry, fighting the virus, except it's not like a war. In a war you don't hide as soon as possible. Maybe we should, but we don't. The other thing about mobilising for war is that production goes up and labour is fully engaged, versus the US experiencing the biggest drop, 13% I believe, in a month since records began. For such a devastating decision, they had better have had excellent reasons and top-notch research. I just overheard this on a conference call. We've got to take a decision by 5th of June, and what do we know right now? Essentially nothing. That is the essence of what this presentation is about. What was known or available to be known as of March 22nd prior to implementing a strategy far more damaging than a true war scenario one destructive of our very democracy. I would hope that it was a decision that had some highly skilled, very bright people agonising over whether they'd got it right. Did everything, and I mean everything, point to this doomsday scenario of 53 million infected, 530,000 deaths, exponential growth threat being right, and those outcomes being utterly inevitable? Because they were about to unleash the most devastating, devastating chemotherapy in history off the back of it. And th was this chemotherapy requiring the cessation of democracy, the cessation of liberty, the cessation of earning, the cessation of the government being able to pay for essential services, was that indeed the only viable way forward? If there were multiple ways to address this crisis, was this the one which had the best trade-off between damage to society and effectiveness against the virus? And they had to be utterly sure, didn't they? I see March 23rd as the most profound and critical moment, the point of no return. Of course, in practice, Johnson could have aborted the lockdown at any time since March 23rd, but evidently he hasn't. No, the whole Denise disease scenario has now been institutionalised, just like the war scenario is with the US, DEFCON status. Indeed, in the video that never was, yet, I was going to point out that we are about to get into a war of disease, to complement the war of terror. And the war of disease is in fact a stroke of genius because it requires no human enemy, the enemy is among us every day, people are dying from enemy action, nobody wants to die mostly, people will clamour to be saved. The war of terror has run and run, still going strong 20 years later, generating a $4 trillion boost to defence spending in the US, 30% of which goes to defence contractors. Not bad for a couple of planes and 3,000 civilians, if you're a sociopath. Indeed, as an aside, far from calling out politicians as sociopaths, we received this in the list of articles from Medium.com. People who refuse to mask are not liberty lovers, they're sociopaths. It isn't even funny, it's the most disgusting piece I've ever read. And of course, it's all utterly reasonable. There's a perfectly good reason to mask, it's to protect your health. Not masking is putting others at risk. That is irresponsible. Your character is defective. You're a sociopath. They are sociopaths. They are not imbued with a love of liberty and choice. They are marinated in a diagnosable antisocial personality disorder. I should probably do a full takedown of this piece, but it emphasises another reason why the March 23rd lockdown decision was critical. It was going to let people like this loose to spread hate and misinformation, targeting of course the only people who are immune from the government misinformation and agenda. Indeed, yet again, I find myself noting the similarity between this and speeding. It's not about road safety, it's about compliance. It's not about health and the virus, it's about compliance. And unsurprisingly, any piece which supports the agenda, belittling or vilifying those opposed to the agenda, is entirely acceptable, no matter how bile-ridden, misinformed and harmful it might be. 
whereas we know the fate of fact-based, calm, cheerful, humorous te ex expert testimony. It gets taken down. Not us yet, we're probably too small, and we've gotten away with a review and losing one satirical video. In an unprecedented move, with the public rooms shut during the COVID-19 crisis, the Imperial War Museum have granted us special permission to do none of the following, so we hope they'll forgive us based on our loyalty to the British people and the great man who stood and fought where modern Britain suggests we should have just sent a note. No worries, enjoy Europe. Note to censors we use modified images with sources attributed to highlight the gravity of the issues under discussion as per fair use. Johnson's historic underground bunker. Discover the stories hidden beneath the streets of Westminster in the cabinet war rooms. Explore the underground bunker that protected the staff and secrets at the heart of Britain's government during the Second Virus War, as Johnson and his inner circle plotted the route to vaccine victory. Indeed, the whole war motif, complete with map scenario, fits very nicely with our determination to get you information based on all the countries and with accurate information rather than misinformation. So let's see what Johnson and Ferguson had access to the day before Johnson made his historic and unprecedented decision that has not only unleashed a lockdown that hasn't spared a single case or saved a single life, see our other videos, particularly chart updates, not only devastated our livelihoods, deprived us of our freedoms and devastated our economy, but it has unleashed the vilest propaganda against the British people, such as the nightly stay-at-home nuclear warning, and unleashed the vilest sociopath to publish against their fellow countrymen, accusing them of being marinated in a diagnosable antisocial personality disorder. I can assure you that Tim J. Wise has gone to the top of my toxic people to take down list, just as soon as we've finished taking down the fraudulent agenda, that continues entirely unchecked. So here we go again, more charts, more of those facts that are so reviled by people who want only compliance and the agenda. By now the chart should look familiar, review our latest chart update if not, but for this exercise we've made two particular changes. We've added the raw data which is normally too jagged and messy for pleasant viewing and the average is perfectly adequate on longer timescales, once we're out a month or more. But for this task, we cannot afford artifacts or errors, misleading elements that are down to e.g. the average, not the actual data. A hint of a curl here needs to be real, because a critical moment is at hand. Go, no go, for lockdown. That is the second change. We have dropped the charts back to March 22nd, so no hindsight here. We're looking exactly what the government had access to as they contemplate making this critical decision as to their highly destructive policy. They had to get this right and so they had to look at every available factor to make sure that the premise, Ferguson's scenario, and the solution, lockdown, were absolutely certain. Dr. Werner von Ferguson's rocket is headed to the moon. Astronomical figures, astronomical deaths, if we don't launch. And the launch will wipe out democracy, wipe out the daily lives and livelihoods of 66 million people, render the nation bankrupt, more than it always is, and remove the ability to pay for critical services. Taxpayers are stuck at home. Fortunately, of course, no one dependent on that taxpayer money will be inconvenienced. Doctors, nurses, police, massive roadworks, they now shut entire motorways and principal roads at whim, are blocked. Go another, also blocked, route. The entire public sector, everyone dependent on government money, don't worry, you'll continue to be paid. Everyone who actually pays for their country, they're shut down. But don't worry, the government will borrow until you're ready to start paying off their debts created by their handling of the crisis. So if it turns out, of course, that Ferguson and Johnson ignored readily available data contradicting their position, that would make them liable for all that has occurred and all the damage arising from it. So what are we looking for in these slides? Firstly, and I'm amazed not having done this chart precisely like this before, that Ferguson was absolutely right. You can indeed fit an exponential curve straight line here on log scales, 
to the UK data ignoring the first few cases and you get an amazing chart that I absolutely agree fits the observed data incredibly well. Seriously, I stand by that. It's my chart. Those cases and total lines for an exponential curve at base 2 on the 1st of Feb, UK first report to World Health Organization was 2 on the 1st of Feb, and a factor of 1.26. To get those lines in alignment, the base of 2 is set to 23rd Feb, offset, and if asked why, one could shrug and say obviously it took time to get going, but clearly the lines show they're nearly a perfect fit. They do, absolutely. Why I'm awed by this is because it is so perfect and because we know how different the real world looked, but not if you restricted yourself to the UK data up to the point of lockdown. Gosh, was our government's decision a sincere one informed by the best available data? And if it turned out to be flawed, was it an honest mistake? And since the vast majority of the population, informed by the press and the PM himself, insist it was not flawed, and the 530,000 was referenced in extending the lockdown speech, no, they stand by this assessment. And what would have happened by May 16th if the PM had not ordered lockdown? 2,075,785,318 people infected, 2.1 billion in Britain alone. Thank God for lockdown. Uh, except we don't have 2 billion people, so what? The infection just goes up until every single Briton is infected. That's absurd. There's got to be at least one escapee out there. But anyway, UK CMO Chris Whitty and Imperial College reassure us only 80% or 81% for Imperial College are infected, thank God. Uh, not much of a difference. The problem is that obviously we're using log scales and that's fraudulent and masking the scale of the crisis. Much better. Wow, so scary. But hang on, that's the entire population of Britain squished at the bottom. And it does feel like that right now. Finally, we're looking for something that is appropriate, that gets people to appreciate the enormity of the threat. And I think this does that, don't you? I mean, we can't even see the current cases. There's flatter than roadkill at the bottom of the chart, but it sure gets across the scale of the crisis. But that line that just ignores the 80% infected, infected limit and ignores the UK population limit. We're assured it won't go past 80%, or that's the estimate, and we know it can't go past 66.25 million, our population. I say that, but these days who knows. But there has to be a reason it stops. People hiding in bunkers? Electromagnetic decay of the virus? Something, right? So what's the reason it stops? Back to Imperial College COVID-19 response team report. Infection was assumed to be seeded in each country at an exponentially growing rate with a doubling time of five days from early January 2020 with the rate of seeding being calibrated to give local epidemics which re reproduce the observed cumulative number of deaths in GB or the US seen by 14th March 2020. Ha! Huh. So just as we surmise, exponential fit to 14th March data, except we did to lockdown day, minus 1, 22nd of March. We should be accurate, so truncate to 14th of March, how does it look? If I was honest, I'd say, a fraction uncomfortable, should be a little later start, slightly higher rate. This would be my honest assessment, and we are trying to be utterly fair in our recreation, aren't we? If nothing else, that will help us to understand their strategic mindset, aka the narrative. And it's just a teensy-weensy little adjustment, and I'd stand by it in court. I do think it's fractionally more accurate. It's also a fraction higher rate, so by a week later, 22nd of March, the exponential rate for the best fit has gone down from 1.29 or 29% per day to 1.26, 26% per day, growth in cases. Declining growth rates, gosh, where have we heard that? Still, let's stick with the prof, we're following his report 9 lead. Oh yeah, that includes the US as well. Mum, do I have to? Yes dear, play nice, they're our friends, remember, go do the chart for the US. But Mum, they're mean to me and say I speak funny. Just say they speak funny back, dear. Play nice, they're our friends, remember, go do the chart for the US. Scrape, scrape, scrape of reluctant feet. Oh, all right. Or Basil Faulty, if you like. Fine, it's not like I wasn't busy trying to save the UK. Not a problem, save the US as well. Anything else? Maybe world peace while I'm at it, dear? <sighs> 
Here's the US data, and the US attitude to informing the world is so casual, to use a polite term, that the day cases are, to use another term. So we'll use markers instead for the days when the US deigned to inform the World Health Organization of its results to date. Now something should be blatantly apparent, and should have been to our eminent Professor Ferguson. These are log scales, and those car curves aren't straight. Neither is. And they're both incredibly similar, which indicates it's not an artifact. And if they're not exponential, linear on log scale, then what are they? They're accelerating, the growth rate going up each day. Not just the cases going up, but the growth rate, CF interest rates, rising every day, accelerating. Where have we seen that? This is going to be the official chart, note the deaths totals, that is obviously not exponential, but has an accelerating phase, rapid curl up, and a decelerating phase established in the climb. Super strictly, a normal distribution never accelerates then decelerates. It is an artifact of linear scales that it does so. In fact, the deceleration is constant from day one. See, for example, our chart update videos. And ultra super strictly, the official recognized epidemic curve that is close to normal is the logistic curve. But they're both humped curves, so close it's like putting a pound of weight on your tummy and losing a pound off your legs. And no, those aren't those, chart, those curves there. And nothing like exponential, where you get to jump off the ground and fly to the moon without stopping. So these are accelerating, which doesn't happen with normal, and I need to check logistic. So that's interesting, but what do we do with anomalies? We ignore them. Yep, if the results don't fit the narrative, we ignore them, just like all the charts will eventually, I hope, get to show you. But it is interesting, so I'll dive in later on my own time. For now, we need a straight line fit, but to which part? From beginning to end, the alpha and omega approach? Just the last bit where it's worst? Naturally, we're not exaggerating, just using the latest data. And you know what? That really is a very reasonable fit for the last bit, using exactly the same growth rate, F equals 1.29, for the US as for the UK, offset slightly for date. So you know what? If Ferguson was charged with not using the best fit and he produced these charts, I'd defend that. They're a good fit. The disconnect with reality and good science comes later, but this is good. So here it is. This is what the US and UK are faced with. The same virus, same rate of growth, exponential at F daily equals 1.29. Doubles every three days, a little under. What does that look like by May 16th? Interestingly, my trick to work back to the nominal population, 53 over 0.8 equals 66.25, gives a US population of 2.2 over 0.81 equals 2.71 or 271 million, not 330 million. Huh. Wow, look at that. Both countries wiped out, or 81% infected at least, per the ICCRT report. By early May, by end of April in fact. I would like to officially nominate 30th April as Wipeout Day, the day by which the US and UK, coincidentally, huh, would have been wiped out by the virus, sorry, 80% infected, if lockdown hadn't saved us. And to honour the inauguration of that day, I'd invite this young lady to play for us. So there it is. Ferguson was right. We were going to be wiped out by 30th of April. Lockdown saved us because, of course, we didn't go anywhere near that. And I've just been lying all along. Or just mistaken. Or something else. Stay tuned for episode two. Will Mikey reveal to his father he's gay? Will his father reveal he's not his father? Will his mother explain her very deep voice? All these and more will not be answered in part two. But yes, we will spend more time in the Furballs bunker and witness events right up to the launch of Vaccine 1. I'm still Andrew Mather, a 60-year-old Brit, mathematician, financier, technologist, husband, biker, pilot, healer, whatever. 
Feel free to get in touch, andrew at peerlessreads.com or andrewamather.com, either should get to me.